If you're a longtime listener of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, you've heard us discuss SAMs, or surface-to-air missiles, plenty of times. First, on Episode 9 with Willie D. I feel this white flash, like when you flip your bathroom lights on in the morning. And I look out, and just as I'm looking out, I see this uh, this uh, exhaust of a missile right at our right 2 o'clock position from the cockpit. And then I hear what sounds like somebody taking a handful of BBs and throwing them against the side of your car. I realized that the, what, what I just seen was a surface-to-air missile, thinking, what the heck was that? And it almost cost us our lives. And then again on episode 53 with Fingers. Uh, we just crossed the beach uh, and go into our cap station, and we got taken under fire by several surface-to-air missile batteries. So we, instead of fighting NICs, we started fighting telephone poles and uh, successfully dodged a couple of them. And I was remember I was looking behind us at one that we had just uh, defeated and one went off over the cockpits, one that we didn't see, which I guess that's always the way it is. And uh, next thing I knew, I'm sitting in the back seat, bleeding all over myself with my hand. And now this week, we take a closer look at these deadly weapons themselves with a guest who dodged a few one heroin night over Iraq. And about that time, our lead, Tomcat, starts calling out missiles. So then he starts calling out, he's like, two missiles in the air, three missiles in the air, and he's like, seven missiles in the air. And I'm like, I'm like turn to my uh, pilot. I'm like, do you see anything? He's like, no, I don't see anything. And so I guess we got to look. And about that time, uh, at about my 10 o'clock, two huge Roman candle uh, shots come out. Boom, boom. Uh, they come up. And then they got to our altitude. And are like, whoa, where are they going? And then they pointed directly at us. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, hmm, so this is how I'm going to go. Sam Lodge, stroke eight, close five, go. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Jello. I am your host. And that intro bumper you just heard, well, that first debuted way back on episode 16. It's one of my favorites, and it certainly applies to today's topic. Don't you think, Crunch? Absolutely, Jello. Great to be here. And I tell you, that <laughs> intro, it's thrilling. That is what? Stroke three from Iraq. Didn't you used to use that video in uh, your surf to air threat lecture? I did. We used that as an example of, you know, sometimes when you're getting shot at, you just got to keep that jet moving. And sometimes you are just going to keep pulling and pulling <laughs> and you make it. And it's awesome. And that's what he did. He did it all right. It's a fight for survival. But anyway, to the listeners, that's right. Craig Snyder is back, as we discussed, here for part two on our little mini-series on surface-to-air threats. Crunch, what's uh, new in the, what, week or two since we saw you? <laughs> oh, it's great. You know, the podcast hit. I've told a few people. Everybody's really excited. It's great stuff. I had a lot of fun, and I'm glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Did you get any feedback from family or friends? Any ribbing or teasing? Uh, no ribbing, teasing. Everybody really liked it. When I told my folks about it, they sat down with a bottle of wine and, and listened to it and finished it. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always thought someone should sit down or maybe I should and uh, like have a bottle of scotch and take a shot every time I say, okay, or cool or awesome, but I wouldn't make it very far. But anyway, no. all right. Well, glad you got good feedback. We here at the show also received quite a bit of feedback. First, one listener wanted to know why we didn't address Western systems like the Swedish RBS-70, among others. Now, Crunch, I don't recall, did you discuss European systems in your lecture way back? Well, actually, when I was a Top Gun instructor and teaching surface-to-air threats to the fighters going through the course, we did touch on that, but only in the sense that we said, hey, we're not going to talk about these today. Why? Because we were talking about threat systems. We did just say, hey, there are some other things out there. And the funny thing is you mentioned the Swedish RBS-70 actually is one that I said, hey, there are other systems like this European system here, the Swedish RBS-70, but it's also Stinger and Patriot and SM2s. And we just did not address those because there's so much in the threat systems for us to talk about, plenty to talk about there. And those are the ones that are being actually shot at us. The rest of us should be working in concert with us rather than against us. So that's where we focused our efforts. Well, and not only that, even among the threat systems, I would argue, you can't cover all of them because there's just so many, especially when we're talking about 
AAA or ADA. Mm -hmm. And so you get the gist of it. You get, hey, this is either mobile or not. It's this caliber. This is the, yeah. the shells and et cetera. So that's right. All right. That's a good one. I had another listener, interestingly, write to say he was leaving the show and not going to listen anymore when he learned that I hunt dove. So, mm. okay. Sorry, I guess it's okay to hunt humans, but not birds. But anyway, well, there you go. Moving on, uh, we even had some feedback by phone. Let's give that a listen. Hi, Jello. This is Christian from Germany. Not really a question here, but more a follow on to last week's show about AAA and what you and Crunch discussed there. You mentioned the term flak and tried to uh, figure out what the term actually refers to. What I can tell you as a German is that in the English language, the word flak is actually a one to one takeover from the German word flak, which is the same letters, F-L-A-K. Flak in German is again an acronym for Flugabwehrkanone, which more or less means air defense cannon or air defense gun. The noun is used in German both for the piece of equipment on the ground, so the gun itself, as well as for the fire effects that they cause in the air. So we flew through a lot of flak, just as it is used in the English language today. And oh, by the way, there's also a similar acronym for SAMS, in the German language, and that is FLARAK, which is short for Flugabwehrrakete, or Air Defense Rocket or Missile. Hey, thanks for all the hard work and uh, time that you and the team invest to create all this wonderful content for us listeners, and for turning commuting into something that I often look forward to. Hey, greetings from Germany, and stay safe out there. Bye-bye. All right, excellent point. And along those lines, Crunch, we had another listener who wrote to say something similar about ACK, ack which I guess some pilots used to call it, and I... Apparently, that is German for 88, which I guess is what, the size of the shells? Makes sense to me. I tell you what, Christian's feedback about uh, Flock being a German word, I don't speak German, but it sounded really cool and made complete sense, and I learned something today. I feel awesome. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. All right. <laughs> well, I usually do on these shows, so that's a good thing. But yet another listener wrote to suggest that the reason AAA is becoming relevant again, his words, is because of the proliferation of drone technology, saying, quote, drones are very cheap and increasingly common. So if your only option is an expensive missile, it becomes really inefficient because you're spending huge amounts of money to shoot down a drone worth only a few hundred dollars. Yeah. If you've got guided AAA, however, you can take down many drones more easily and more cheaply than if you had to use missiles. A couple things there, though. Crunch, your opinion? I didn't think AAA was ever not relevant, and I didn't know that. I mean, sure, you worry about money, but in combat, you really kind of don't. Well, not only that, I mean, you can field so much for so little cash when it comes to yeah. AAA. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And it's the most simple of surface air threats out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to the whole, you know, we were talking about drones last time a little bit. I offer that it'd be pretty hard to shoot down a drone with a rifle too. <laughs> <laughs> True. I think I would be challenged. Yeah. I'm not a dove hunter. <laughs> well, good. Uh, listeners will accept you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's my show now. Yeah, Jello right. has left the building to go dove hunting. I've got it from here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what else. Uh, our old friend Ken Katz from last year's B-52 episode, he wanted to clarify something that we answered in regards to one of the listener questions. Uh, he said that Boat said all USAF fighters carry nuclear weapons, but then backed it up by saying not the A-10 or the F-22. Ken wants us to know that the F-15 C and D, or probably A through D, also cannot deliver nuclear bombs. The only Air Force fighters right now are the F-15E and the F-16C, so presumably the D model as well. Mm. And then he also said that the uh, fighters carry, that boat said the B-83. No, that's only carried by the B-2, but that we would have been talking about the B-61 ah. bomb. So I guess that just points out that we really don't know because we don't deal with it. Crunch, in your early Tomcat days, was that ever a, a thing for you guys? No, we never did nuclear weapons with a Tomcat. Matter of fact, the last I'm aware of anything like that, I'm pretty sure the A6s had that capability on the ships way back when, but that was never while I was there. Yeah. No, me neither. And we talked about that with Boat on your episode last week. And yeah. So Ken is just filling in some of the blanks. Thank you, Ken. He's always good like that. In other announcements, this past week, we released a bonus episode promoting our friend Buck Wyndham's book, Hogs in the Sand. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. There was also a bonus 
podcast episode. And so whatever your favorite podcast app is, you can find it there. And then this past week, we released a new musing on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. Our former F-16 guest, T-Day, wrote a guest blog titled Crossing the Pond about the logistics and execution of crossing oceans in fighters. I never did that crunch. Did you have a chance to uh, take a Super Hornet or a Tomcat across an ocean? Nope, I never did. Uh, I've taken one from East Coast to West Coast, which is about the same distance as, say, the Atlantic, like short Europe, but it's just not the same when you have the opportunity to divert into Tinker, whereas you don't at the Atlantic. So yeah, that's right. I've never done that. It's got to be a challenge. It doesn't sound very fun, but apparently T-Day did it like 15 times, I think, mm. and the single engine. So that must have been a little unnerving, but eh, good on him. I guess he's a man and I'm not. There it is. All right. So... <laughs> <laughs> Finally, this is episode 95, and you might recall from previous discussions that we're planning to throw ourselves a little birthday party and celebrate our 100th episode coming up in December. Well, part of that is getting feedback from you, the listener. So if you would be so kind to spend a couple minutes on a short survey, then head over to fighterpilotpodcast.com forward slash 100 survey, 100 survey, and let us know which are your favorite episodes, who your favorite guests were, and crunch, no lobbying here, mm. and a couple other questions, and we'll compile that for a show that will air. Uh, it's our 100th. It's going to be at the end of the year, and it should be a lot of fun. All right. All right, crunch, you got time for a couple listener questions? Yeah, let's do it. Excellent. Our first is an email. It's from Christian in Oslo, Norway, who asks, I listened to episode three recently about clothing and equipment since survival equipment was my field while serving with the Royal Norwegian Air Force. In our Air Force, pilots are required to fly with survival suits, maybe with the exception of the C-130 and P-3 drivers, in case they have to ditch or eject over water. I can assure you the waters surrounding Norway can be pretty cold. U.S. Navy pilots are, as I understand, not subjected to the same requirement unless flying over cold water. How cold? When will survival suits be required? So, Crunch, what do you think? I never had to wear these very often, but I think the knowledge is somewhere back there. What about you? Did you have to wear them a lot? All the time. Every winter flying out of Oceana here in Virginia Beach, we'd be wearing them whenever we flew over the ocean. So uh, okay. the rules are written as such. It says anytime that you're going to be it's basically designed so that if you're expecting that if you eject and you end up in the water, that you will survive long enough to be pulled out by the search and rescue assets. So take that into account. How far away from shore are you going to be? Are there helicopters or ships around? And then most importantly, what's the sea state, sea surface temperature and the wind state? If you take all that into account, the simple way to look at it is if the water temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or less, you're in a dry suit. If it's between 50 and 60, it can be waived by the commanding officer, which typically means only in the daytime or if there are SAR assets nearby. But most COs would say, nope, nighttime, below 60, you're wearing it. And above 60 degrees, it's optional. Most people would not wear it. But there's also the issue of you know sea state. And if the seas are too high, it may significantly delay your rescue, and you really should consider wearing it for your own survival. You know, it's one of those things you never wanted to deal with because it was a pain to put on. It was uncomfortable. But man, God forbid, if you ended up in the drink, you'd be sure happy to have it. Unless, of course, it tore on ejection and let cold water in. But Ooh. at any rate, Ow. yeah, I didn't have to wear it near as much in Lemoore. But our problem there was that we had such a long wait for possible rescue if you were way out the far end of the whiskey area mm -hmm. that you might be sitting out there for a couple hours mm -hmm. waiting on a c-130 to drop a raft or a boat or a helicopter and so that was always an issue for us and so that was a good question yeah great one all right next let's take a phone call hi vincent dave george again calling from boulder colorado my question is if you didn't previously have a private pilot license before joining the military and got a pilot slot would you get your private pilot in the military training you receive, or is this a certification you would have to get on your own? Love the podcast. Really enjoyed that A1 Sky Raider episode and the U2 Dragon Lady. Thank you for your service. Bye. All right, Crunch. Now, I remember what I did after I was winged, but I'm curious what your experiences were. What did you think of Dave's question here? Dave had an excellent question about the pilot's license. And I tell you, I don't know about you. I believe you did the same thing I did, which is once you get winged as a naval aviator, you can then take a military equivalency test with the FAA. And it's a short exam. I want to say it's 45 minutes. And you're just going over some of the federal aviation regulations that you may not be familiar with as a military pilot. The requirements to become a commercially certificated 
aviator with the FAA are uh, off the top of my head, 250 flight hours, 100 have to be in an airplane, 50 in fixed wing, things like that, and an instrument rating in there. When you're a winged aviator, you certainly have met all of those minimums. All you have to do is pass a written test that shows you know all the nuances of the federal aviation regulations that you may not be intimately familiar with. Once you do that, you now have your equivalent commercial certificate, not necessarily an airline transport pilot like you and I have as airline pilots. Right. That requires a whole other check ride. Oh, yeah. Knowledge test. No, I do remember that there was a service in Pensacola that you could pay and they would kind of cram you with all the questions that you could expect to see. Mm-hmm. And then you took the test and generally everybody passed. And then I always thought it was funny that, you know, in any airplane I ever flew, I always felt pretty comfortable because the Navy does such a good job of making sure you know the thing inside and out. And yet with that test, you could go theoretically get checked out in a Cessna and go zoom around. And I just never felt like I knew that as well. And it's just as deadly. Oh, absolutely. I I don't know about you, but I'm also a certified flight instructor on the side. And it's a completely different type of flying when you go out in a piston propeller, single engine, high wing airplane, completely different Mm -hmm. than everything you and I have flown in the past. It's a different type of aviation. But it'll still kill you just as quick. Just as fast. Maybe faster because there's no ejection seat and no dry suit. There it is. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, I do remember. I forget what part it was. It might have been when I got to El Toro, but I remember there was three flight students and one of their wives who flew to like Palm Springs and a little Cessna one weekend, Mm. and they didn't do the weight and balance and account for the high altitude and the heat. And unfortunately, they crashed on takeoff and killed all four of them. Oh, no. And it was just one of those reminders that this is serious business. That's right. So I did a little civilian flying, but not much. I was always very concerned every time I did because I realized I didn't know this as well as I'm used to knowing my Navy airplane. That is so true. Finally, another email. This one is from Sean. Not sure where Sean is from. Sean asks, I wanted to ask you about your experience with low-level routes or routes. How did you use them in training? Was it just to get experience flying low and fast or were they used to get somewhere in particular? Also, do you have a favorite route? I always hear VR 1350 or 1355 is the best low level route. So Crunch, I'll tell you right now, I don't remember the numbers of any of my favorites. My favorite was whatever I was flying that day, but (laughs) yeah, what do you think about low level? Well, I used to love flying low level, uh, flight routes, so those visual routes, those VR routes. There were a couple around here at Oceana we flew all the time, the 1753 and 1758. And I only remember those because they were uh, here. And the, the 1753 was pretty boring. The 58 was better. Went down the mountains, so, you know, western Virginia down to Roanoke and then crossed Lake Gaston. And then we bombed Navy Dare and came back and landed. It was awesome. Nice. But uh, the fun ones were all out there in El Centro and the West Coast and the Chocolate Mountains. And wow, I tell you, you guys always had the best ranges out on the West Coast. And we'd have to co- fly all the way across the country to go fly them. Yeah. I thought they were a 10 something, but 1350, sure, I'll buy it. I don't remember. Well, those could be the ones up near Whidbey Island, which I've heard good things about, never had a chance to fly them. And so I think you're right, though, because the routes where there is some terrain, mountains, Mm -hmm. ideally, is always more exciting. You can go down the valleys, you can go checkpoints. If you're just out in the south where it's just going from tower to bridge to uh, what was the little red roof restaurants we used to use? Can't think of it suddenly, but you know, you're looking for all these things, but it's a little more fun when there's some topography, I guess. I will say this just to expand on that a little bit. There was one time that really stands out in my memory. I went over to England and got to fly around in the backseat of a Hawk T2, which is the Royal Air Force trainer. So our T-45 Goshawk was mm-hmm. fashioned after the Hawk. So it was the Hawk T-2 with the upgraded system. It's really fancy. I could talk for a while about this. I really liked it. But we got to do a low level and I'm <laughs> flying around doing low level England style. And we went and did their mock loop and everything. And it was just a hoot. It was so much fun. Oh, I bet. You probably have a lot of pictures of you out there. Yeah. I have a whole file full of pictures of this. This is a pretty cool one. Well, to the crux of Sean's question though, it is good training. There are missions that are required pilots to fly at low altitude. That is a skill you need. Mm -hmm. It makes you a better pilot, I argue, because you have to do what are called mission cross-check times where you spend part of your time flying the aircraft, part of your time looking out for terrain avoidance and obstruction clearance and all that. It is fun. I mean, that is one reason to do it. Sometimes if you're going somewhere and you have sufficient fuel, if there's a low level on the way, you can do it. You just have to schedule it with the appropriate agency. Mm -hmm. Again, I would just say it's one of those proficiency items. And I think, I don't know, Crunch, were you a TNR guy? Isn't there some requirement in our training for a squadron to have a certain amount of uh, low level experience recently? There absolutely is. Uh, you know, you and I both had to be intimately familiar with that when we were both training officers. And I tell you, there, uh, there is a skill there. If you can fly low level fast and in that dynamic 
high stress, high task load environment, it really translates well into being able to handle other high stress, high task load environments. Yeah. So there's definitely value there in the training. And yes, we did track that. And it was a requirement that you be current on that in order to go deploy and be combat ready. Well, I thought so, but it's been 17 years since we were training officers. So I, well, I could be making it up completely. There's no way anybody's <laughs> going to check my work. I, I could be completely making this. Hey, you'd be surprised. We have a lot of active duty guys who listen and they don't hold back. They don't know. It's all changed. They're saying Northern instead of North. What do they know? They don't know. Oh stuff. my goodness. <laughs> Speaking of that, <laughs> the listeners right now are really confused, Crunch. You and I both yes, know. I know. They haven't heard, heard the interview yet. <laughs> we have. And so why don't we get to it, man? So thanks for the questions, everyone. But let's get to the interview with Jethro. Now, uh, we'll get to some of the calm brevity stuff, folks. What Crunch is talking about is at the end, we talk a little bit about how Top Gun is updating tactics all the time. And sometimes it's a trade-off, frankly, because there are certain things we want, but the Air Force wants it different. And so you'll get to that. But overall, Crunch, before we listen to it, you had a chance to preview. What do you think? I thought it was an incredible interview. I didn't realize where the story was going until he started telling it. And I actually was sitting at my kitchen table last night. Everybody else in the house had gone to bed. And I was like, oh, this thing is uh, it's a little long. I better uh, sit, get down to it and listen to this uh, before you and I talk today. And before you knew it, it was over. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, that was an hour. It was just so riveting to listen to that story. It was absolutely great. Everybody buckle up. It's going to be a good one. No doubt. All right. Well, with that, let's get to it. All right. Captain Tom Bodine is in the Navy. He's a former Top Gun instructor. He was a Rio. He's not a Wizzo. He's a lot of things. But right now, he's our latest guest on the show. How's it going, Jethro? It's going well. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. You're over what? In the Norfolk area? I am over at uh, Oceana is where I'm stationed at currently. Okay. Outstanding. Well, uh, you are our latest guest, like I said, and today we're going to talk about surface-to-air missiles. But as I recall, that wasn't necessarily your specialty at Top Gun. Is that right? No, that is correct. I was uh, radar theory, so I had my hand in it a little bit. Ah. And then I was tactical crew coordination as well. Ooh. Okay, good. We get that question a lot. So we're going to add you to our Rolodex uh, so we can know who to talk to for those issues. But let's start at the beginning, Jethro. Where are you from? Where did you go to school? What did you do in the military, just highlights-wise, up until now? Yeah, I grew up in Alabama. Uh, that's where I went to high school in Decatur, right outside of Huntsville. Okay. Did my college at Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, uh, ROTC scholarship there. Directly out of there into the Navy, Naval Aviation. Uh, started my career, as you mentioned, in Tomcats, flying the Mighty A with VF-14 at the time out of Oceana. And then uh, midway through my J.O. tour, I was, a, I was a little unique. 14 and our sister Tomcat Squadron 41 transitioned both to the Super Hornet. 14 went to the single seat variant, the E. 41 went to the F. And so I actually transitioned to the Super Hornet and changed J.O. squadrons in the middle of my J.O. tour. Oh, wow. uh, and then among all of that, I also moved out to Lemoore to make that transition <laughs> happen. Right. So I've been Super Hornet since then, uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, I did the remaining time there with VFA-41 in Lemoore up to Top Gun. Did my training tour out in Japan with VFA-102. Came back for a DH tour to Oceana with VFA-103. And then I went to the Millington, did a little time there, did a little time at the War College, rather. Okay. And then I did the XO tour out at uh, VFA-122 as the FRS XO. And then I went to my fleet squadron, VFA-22 in Lemoore for my XO CO ride. After that, I did a fellowship in Chicago with a think tank out there and then went to the Pentagon for about a year to work in OSD CAPE, which is Capabilities Assessment and Program Evaluation, which is a fancy way of saying it's a budgetary and programmatic overview office for the DOD, my portfolio was TAC Air, a naval TAC Air to be specific. All right. And so now you're in Oceana and you are a deputy air wing commander, as I understand. Yep. For the Freedom Fighters of uh, Air Wing 7. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, of course, as we always say at the end of the show, just because you're still active duty doesn't mean you're representing them or anything else. But we do appreciate you taking the time to be our guest today. So you had a chance to listen to Crunch's discussion from last week. I did. Yeah, he's a character. Very entertaining. Yeah. And so IADS wise, right, we talked about the integrated air defense and the different ways we can detect aircraft as far as the coastal observers and different ways. And then you've got the AAA, but you've also got the SAMs. So let's just start off big picture. Like, well, what is a surface to air missile? 
It's just that it is a missile that starts from the surface and uh, goes to the air in an attempt to take out uh, flying objects, generally aircraft, but as well helos, and now in this modern age of warfare, UAVs as well. So mm -hmm. that is the general synopsis of what a surface-to-air missile and a SAM system does, and there's a yeah. 101 permutations that you can build that system. <laughs> and even though we don't necessarily call our own systems SAMs, I think it's interesting that the AIM-7 Sparrow that you and I have both flown with has a basically a SAM version of it that if you launch it from a ship, let's say, that it's effectively, like you said, now it's from the surface instead of from the air, so it's really just a missile. And then Basically, as I understand, when we talk about SAMs, we think of threats. So we're all familiar, let's say, with the MiG-29 fulcrum. And the MiG-29 is what the Russians call it, and the fulcrum is what NATO calls it. Is there a similar terminology in SAMs as far as what we refer to uh, the various threats here in the West? Yeah, absolutely. I think the one that's probably been in the news the most recently is the Russian-built surface-to-air system. The S-300 is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And then it has very various iterations uh, for export versions. But we would call that the SA-20, and I believe it is the Grumble. Don't quote or me gargoyle, on that. Gargoyle, maybe? Gargoyle. There you go. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the S-300, I think, is also the genesis of the SA-10. The point being is that you've got the indigenous terminology, and then you have what NATO calls it. And so SA, duh, surface to air, mm -hmm. and then just various numbers through progression over time. And then for whatever reason, all the surface to air missiles start with a G, the names, don't they? Guidelines, Grumble, Gargoyle. Golly, how many are there? Not a golly, I don't think. Yeah, Goa, <laughs> Giant. Yeah, they're gainful. And the, the whole thing is, and that's... Uh, Gecko. NATO got together and they settled on G for surface-to-air missiles. And so when they, they go right. about naming them, I don't know who gets that pleasure, but uh, they come up with a name for a G, and that is the missile okay. generally associated with the surface-to-air system. And SAMs come in a variety of sizes, don't they? They do. Uh, you have your tactical SAMs and then kind of your on one end of your tactical SAMs, and those are your small, even man pads or uh, manual uh, IR heat seekers that are basically tactical ground forces, very unit-specific defense, all the way up to your strategic SAMs, which would be that S-300, SA-10, or SA-20 system, mm -hmm. and then everything in between from size of warhead to how far they go to how high they go to how fast they go. Uh, right. They run pretty much the gambit there. Right. And so to your point, you have the shoulder fired, uh, as we call man pads. I think, what is that? Man portable something. I'll have to look that one up. Man portable air defense, I believe is what it stands for. Yeah. Of course, something like that, because it's man portable and shoulder fired is not going to have as great a range as let's say an SA-5, which is like a space shuttle launch. Apparently I've never <laughs> seen one, but you know, those things are enormous and can go arguably hundreds of miles. Yeah, originally uh, built to shoot down B-52s and U-2s, the SA-5. Okay. Go out there to reach out and touch somebody is what those do, while the, the man pads are exactly that, is to protect the man on the ground, uh, mostly from uh, helos, actually. So that being the case, and you intimated it, uh, mobility-wise, is a strategic SAM going to run around or is a tactical SAM going to be on a vehicle or what can you tell us? I mean, obviously a, a soldier can be about everywhere. Yeah, I think the lines are blurring. I think back when you and I were young ones going through the Top Gun <laughs> class, it was uh, definitely there was a difference. You had your operational or your tactical SAMs and those were mobile and could be moved around. And that's still the case for your very tactical SAM as well. SA-22s uh, would be the modern version. Okay. But your more SA-2s, old school SA-2s, SA-5s, strategic SAMs had prepared locations. We knew where they were, and they were, again, defending strategic assets. And that's not just military, but also diplomatic and economic strategic assets. Mm -hmm. And they had very prepared sites, and they didn't move around a whole lot. However, with the introduction of modern systems and modern technologies, uh, lighter, cheaper, faster, more reliable, what we're seeing with the SA- 10s and 20s of the world is that they too are more mobile and becoming less and less static on the battlefield. And why is mobility important to either a fighter crew or a planner? Uh, the mobility uh, plays a big factor. Obviously, I think you talked about it at Crunch a little bit, right? 
you'd prefer just to avoid these guys altogether if you could in your planning right. process. Uh, so knowing where they are and what type of system is at each location will give you the ability to plan around it if so able, right? Sure. So knowing where that guy is, extremely important in the planning process just from a safety and mission effectiveness perspective. Well, and alternatively, if your target is the SAM system and it's mobile, well, then there's some element of uncertainty on whether it's going to be there or not. Yeah, absolutely. So these mobile systems can pop up where you don't expect them. And so that's where the intelligence comes in because you have to start studying your adversary to say, well, even though they're mobile, they don't really move around because they don't want to spend the money on gas or something. Or, hey, they have these SA2s, but guess what? They've got five fixed sites and every so often they'll pick up all their vans and missile launchers and toys and cables and everything else, right? And they'll move from one site to the other. And so we don't really know where they'll be, but they'll be among these five different places. So it really factors into mission planning. And nowadays too, you can lump in your uh, electronic warfare into that as well, Uh, right? If you want to jam it, you have to know where the antennas are sitting. That's right. And we had many me on the show talking about all those considerations and uh, matters, if you will. All right. I think another important reason to know the size, if you will, or the types is for the ranges. Uh, And we kind of talked on that briefly, but like you said, the man pads, sort of that soldier in the field who's being harassed by helicopters or slower moving aircraft. Well, that man pad can reach up, you know, what, a couple, several thousand feet, couple miles kind of thing. But like you said, an SA-2 or 5 might want to reach out and start hitting the bombers well before they get to us. And so those particular missiles need to be able to fly quite a bit farther. Yes, absolutely. Which would then, when you start nailing down what you want to do with your SAM system. It's not going to start defining the parameters of it uh, with regards to what, how big you're going to build your missile and then what sort of uh, guidance you're going to plan on using with that missile as well. Yeah. All right. So talk us through a typical engagement sequence. Now, we, again, talked with Crunch about some of the early warning stuff, but if you find yourself in your F-18F, let's say, and you are going to be targeted by a SAM, uh, and I'm just putting it that way because for demonstration purposes, obviously you don't necessarily want to find yourself in that situation. But what can you tell us about from the initial, somebody's going to hand queuing off, but then there's the launch and boost, there's the guidance, there's the terminal. Talk us through some of that. You hit most of it there. So, you know, (laughs) obviously they have to have a way of identifying where you are. And that is through, I think you've already talked to their early warning network, whether that be observers or radar systems or even electronic surveillance systems. And that's going to feed into a a data collection that they are going to build a track file on you so that they find and fix you, put you in a piece of sky. And then they're going to assign a specific platform, generally in the SAM world, that is a radar site, that is a target tracking radar. So general life cycle is the early warning radars will find and fix you. They will pass that fix off your location in the sky to a tracking target tracking radar that will still develop a fire control solution because the EW's systems, the early warning radar systems, don't have enough fidelity in the position of your aircraft in three dimensions that it can actually guide a missile to you and have it fuse on your aircraft. So they need to pass it off to a target tracking radar, which generally has a narrow beam width and kind of can stare in one piece of sky. It narrows down that uncertainty volume, as we'd like to call it. Mm -hmm. Then they can launch a missile once you get into the proper parameters, that being range and altitude. And then that target tracking radar can then continue to track you depending on the guy guidance system. I'm sure we'll get into the different guidance systems here in a minute to lead your missile to a successful engagement or hopefully a successful engagement. If it's us, if it's being directed toward us, hopefully we can do some (laughs) things to disrupt that. Yeah. And again, many me talked about that. So I'm imagining a deer hunter out in the hills and he's got a pair of binoculars. And so he's using that because it has a bigger field of view to glass, as they say, the hillside. But once he sees a worthy target, then he'll go to the scope on his rifle, which is more focused, but also more narrow. Is that something uh, like what you're talking about? That's a great way of putting it. Yes. All right. So at some point, again, the fidelity is there for the missile. And then 
we don't necessarily need to talk about the decision to launch as far as that's up to the commander there, the IATS commander. But at some point, if they launch a missile on an aircraft, there's always a little safety for arming because you don't want to detonate right next to the host aircraft. Mm -hmm. But generally, when it goes off, it can start maneuvering usually pretty quickly and arm fairly quickly. Is that always true for SAMs? And I'm thinking maybe some of these more strategic SAMs that have to get off the ground with all that mass. No is my initial answer, but that is for the, what I will call the historic or the more traditional, really the older right. strategic SAM. So when you're talking about an SA-5, even some of the SA-12, uh, the older systems, they had that boost phase, which is just get them out of the tube, get them to altitude with some airspeed on them, because once the fuel runs out, that's it. They're as fast as and as maneuverable as they're ever going to be. And now they're just going to trade that kinetic energy to try to make an intercept happen. Mm -hmm. You have a boost phase generally on the bigger systems. The more tactical systems have less of a boost phase and more of a just an impulse phase where it burns whatever small amount of fuel it has, again, to get it up to speed and altitude to run you down. Right. And then once you kind of get up there, the rocket motor burns, depending on the type of missile, either very short in the terms of a man pad, maybe less than two seconds, to very long, depending on more of our longer range systems that do have that boost phase, could be in the 30, uh, half a minute to a full minute time frame, depending on the specific missile and the specific profile. But then it's into glide phase. And from there, it's just receiving commands through a variety of ways to deflect fins, to guide that missile, missile's warhead rather, onto your aircraft. And I'm mindful of, although I don't remember what system, and maybe it's better that I don't, frankly, that some of them would even actually not be able to guide until it was done with its boost because it was literally blocking that part of the missile on the back. So I think about the space shuttle, for example, when it used to go up, you had those two booster rockets and they would fire and get the thing going. But then at a certain point, they would burn out and detach. And then the shuttle kept going with the big tank. And so some of these missiles are, <laughs> sometimes I'm told, I guess, from guys who saw more than I did, that when they go off, they look like a space shuttle launch because there's just so much boost. And then like the SA-5, it'll have parts that fall off. I think the SA-3 is that way too. Yeah. And so it's just the idea is, again, to get it up there with enough kinematic energy so that it can hopefully consummate the intercept while it's essentially decelerating after that. Yeah, absolutely. And again, when we talk about guidance, which I'm assuming is coming up, you're absolutely right. So the data link antennas and how the missile is communicating to know where the target is, if those booster phases have the potential to block those data link antennas, mm -hmm. absolutely, it would not be able to guide until that initial boost phase is complete. Yeah. Well, and let's talk guidance now, because uh, that's obviously the next part of this intercept as we imagine it chronologically. But also, I think people can hopefully draw a parallel here with our air-to-air -air weapons episode with Boat way back when. Because if you know about the AMRAM, the Sparrow, and the Sidewinder, you've got a pretty good idea of the types of guidance here, don't we? Pretty much. You got a little more modern systems these days, but if you know those three air to air missiles, then you've got the basics for SAMs down. I think the older SAMs started out with what's called command uh, guidance or command line of sight, is what it's referred to as well. And that's where the missile is essentially carrying a warhead, a fuse, and then a bunch of fuel, and then some engines or hydraulics that will deflect the fins and some basic flight computers. And these are the older systems. And what happens there is you got that target tracking radar that we talked about. It's going to shoot the missile up or the system is going to shoot the missile up. And then that target tracking radar is going to track both the target and the missile. And it's going to say, missile, you need to go to position X, Y, and Z to consummate this intercept with the target. And therefore, it's going to not only continue to ID the aircraft, the target aircraft in 3D, but it's also going to tell the missile, ID the missile in three dimensions, and then go to get from where you are to the projected point of impact for that aircraft. You now need to fly in this dread, this heading mm -hmm. at this altitude kind of thing. And so that's command line of sight. Limitations there is the target tracking radar, which we said is is necessarily that smaller beam width. Now you have to have both the target and the missile in that small beam width as it flies out. Ah, 
And as you can kind of think of a flashlight, if you will, shine on the ground, right? If you shine that flashlight spot close to you, it's a smaller spot size and further away from you, it's a bigger spot size. So in these command guidance systems, the further away from that radar that it gets, the bigger the uncertainty volumes become because you can either see a very small piece of sky and know that your target's in there, Mm -hmm. or you see a much larger piece of sky and kind of guess within there where your target is. And again, what you'll see is this was uh, used early on in SAM systems. So uh, associated with that are very big warheads that go along with it because they know that uncertainty volume at range gets much bigger. So in order to cover that range, you just got to make a bigger missile with a bigger warhead. But a bigger missile and a bigger warhead has a lot more mass, and that can then sacrifice its maneuverability and its ranges and various things. So yep. everything and, is a trade-off, right? Right, and then it also makes it a lot less mobile, right? If you make a bigger missile, exactly. it becomes less mobile as well. Yep. Okay. Well, what are some other types of guidance? You talked about the command line of sight. Yeah, command line of sight. And then you got your semi-active, uh, which is very much like your Sparrow, your SA-7, right? So yeah. you got your radar on the ground. Yeah. It's uh, illuminating the target. Well, beams are jumping off that target going back to the radar. But if we put a radar receiver in the missile head itself, then the missile can also see those radar returns. And now it doesn't need the radar sight on the ground to tell it where it goes. It's got the flight computers on board to go, I see the reflected radar energy from the target. That's right. Now I can just steer towards that target. So that would be semi-active. And that was kind of the next iteration in technology and SAM systems. So I don't normally like to point out my friend's mistakes, but you said SA-7, and I know you meant AIM-7. Oh, uh, because <laughs> There is an SA-7. It's a yes. shoulder-fired. And so I think one of the weaknesses of this particular system, as we talked about in our air-to-air weapons episode, is that if the radar that's hosting the energy that the missile is looking at takes some harm or otherwise shuts down or gets jammed, then this missile is not going to do much good, is it? Yeah, and that's one of the vulnerabilities of this type of system. Absolutely right. All right. Uh, What else do we have for guidance? The next step forward then would be more like your AIM-120, where you have active guidance. And this one is where I put the full radar set into the nose of the actual missile. So I still have a radar sight that still does that target tracking. Then it's going to go, here's where the target is, pass that information off to the missile, and then I'm going to shoot the missile, and then it's just going to go and do its own thing. Some some limitation with this, obviously, if I'm actively radiating from my missile, then I've got to have some sort of power generation on board that missile. So since we don't usually have power generation, that comes in the form of battery cells, Mm -hmm. which then makes the missile heavier, right? And a little more expensive as well. To your point, if the radar site shuts down because it doesn't want to get hit by a harm or it uh, wants to just protect itself or it's getting jammed, well, now we don't have to worry about it as much because now the missile, once it's out of the tube, can do the tracking all on its own. Right. Generally speaking, however, battery life on those types of missiles are much shorter than the entire time of flight for those missiles. So what you'll see is that in addition to that battery and that radar that's supposed to be able to transmit and receive on the missile, it'll also have its own INS on board or inertial navigation system mm-hmm. so that it kind of knows where it is. It'll fly out to a point so that it knows that once I turn my battery on to start radiating, I'll have enough battery life to get me to my impact point. Yeah, It's a, a kind of a dual uh, navigation mode f- for most of those missiles. And you bring up an interesting point because for fighter crews who I've always argued on this show need to have a wealth of knowledge akin to, in my opinion, attorneys and doctors and other professions that we tend to think of as very high cerebral requirements. You have to know all these things because if let's say it can go kinematically a certain distance, but it's got some sort of battery limitation. Well, then that's just one more thing we need to know about because while the range could be just some hundred miles, let's say for fun, but based on time of flight, the battery's going to run out at 80. Well, then that changes things about what we know about the threats. Absolutely. Yeah. And the more we know how to build the threat missiles, that gives us greater capabilities and determine vulnerabilities and counters to those systems. So that's right. Uh, that would be battery life would be one of those things we would look at for yeah. missile systems, for SAM systems that use the active missiles. 
Yeah, so that just makes the point of Sun Tzu, right? Who said you have to know yourself and know the enemy because if you go in without knowing something about the enemy, then you're obviously at a disadvantage. Yeah, who knew we were going to come talk about Sam's and Sun Tzu all at the same time? <laughs> well, on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Jethro, you never know what you're going to get with me, but uh, the <laughs> listeners stick with me anyway. So uh, this is good stuff. All right, so command line of sight. Semi-active, active. Are there any other types of SAMs? So you got passive, which uh, you'll see most of the passive ones. I think the best way to relate that is to the uh, like the Sidewinder air-to-air missile. So you got the IR. Mm -hmm. So there's no actual reflected energy of any sort from threat systems. In fact, the missile is just tracking on something your aircraft is doing, sound, heat, light, could be radio frequencies, and it is using some sort of sensor to detect that, determine that is indeed an aircraft, and that aircraft is indeed a target, and then flying to that. And again, probably the most common application of this is in the IR world, as seen by used on most man pads, Mm -hmm. as well as in our own AIM-9X Sidewinder. Yeah. So flip on the light in the dark when you're camping and here come all the moths, right? So uh, they're homing in on the light in that case. And so, yes, we have different types of SAMs that can be a real problem, frankly, for air crew, because if you don't have that radar indication that we sometimes rely on with our certain receivers, then it's possible that, because I, I would argue the biggest SAM threat is the one you don't see. Certainly there are some that are more maneuverable, longer range, faster, et cetera. But the one you don't see is probably going to be the real problem. And if there's someone shooting at the heat in your tailpipes, that could be real bad. Yeah, it's always the one you don't know about that gets you, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what we saw, at least uh, in my experience, is I think Peer actors, right? State actors are very good at building surface to air threats, but then you have non state actors as things get cheaper and more readily available, they start piecing things together in what we like to call Frankenstein SAMs. Mm-hmm. And so if they can grab a rocket motor here, but they don't have the complex circuitry to produce a radar inside the nose, but I stole a whatever, or I've got a man pad that I bought, but I can take that man pad seeker and kind of jimmy rig it onto the top of this much larger rocket motor. Now maybe mm-hmm. I have a capability for a man pad that usually, like you said, only goes up to a couple of thousand feet out to a couple miles. Now I have the ability to maybe take this missile and put it out much further than uh, what was originally designed for. And again, it's that one you don't know about. And we definitely wouldn't know about these Frankenstein ones that can be uh, very dangerous as well. Especially to some of our players who usually have the benefit of distance, right? So you've got AWACS, you've got tankers, maybe the bombers before they even get there are all at range. And so if you just send something out into the fray that's got an IR seeker and you're not too worried about fratricide, well then, hey, it's going to lock onto something and off it goes. And some of those platforms have a lot of wing form and I guess wing form is not my point, but it's a bigger airframe. So it's got a lot of heat uh, with a lot more engines. So yeah, you're right. That could be a real threat to some of those forces. Yeah. And and we talked about that, the EO world, because we talk about IR, which we usually think about heat, but Mm -hmm. the EO world. So think closed circuit TV, right? Same thing. I can slap something on there with a closed circuit TV. And as long as I can able identify an object close enough to whatever my rules of engagement are to go, I think that's close enough to an enemy aircraft that it just lock on a thing that looks like that in my CCTV mm-hmm. that's now strapped onto my missile and go out there. And to your point, put that on a very long range missile, no indications at all, because it's just looking right. It's not transmitting anything. Yeah. So yeah, those can become very dangerous. So we talked about the guidance, but what about the guidance. Uh, I know that's a dumb thing to ask, but in other words, what I'm saying is, do these missiles all generally fly a similar profile when they're attacking an aircraft? No, they do not. So it all depends on the guidance system in use. So for instance, the uh, command line of sight, the very early ones, because the missile and the aircraft had to all be in the same beam width of that target tracking radar, which is usually co-located with where the missile actually left the ground from. What you're going to see in the air is if that thing's being shot at you, it's going to continually drift aft. It's going to 
look as if it's pointing at you, but it's going to continually drift aft in your line of sight as it's kind of riding that radar beam and trying to consummate that intercept. Mm -hmm. And that would be different from the semi-active or even the active to some extent where they no longer need to be in that beam with, right? So they can do a much better job of computing an impacted point further out because they can fly outside the beam with, opens up their aperture, if you will, to fly a much better profile to give them better in-game G and airspeed. And what you're going to see on those is they generally stay steady on your line of sight to them, line of bearing to the aircraft. And so they will not drift aft and they will just kind of point at you and stay where they are on the canopy until impact for those command line of sight and uh, or rather for the semi-active and then similarly for the active. Interestingly enough, though, there, Jello, the latest and greatest systems are using kind of a combination of something we've already talked about. I think the systems are called uh, secreted ground guidance. Okay. And that's essentially using a beefed up INS to go much further out, right? A lot less battery power required for that. So they can go much further from their actual launch point. And then when they get close to their target or where they think their target is, then they'll flip their radars on and then go full active. And so while that sounds like active, what's different there is they're actually using a data link that's from the radar site and the new systems don't, it's not necessarily the radar site that the missile left from. Uh So it's using a data link to tell it where to go and then turn its radar on. Then once it turns its radar on, it may not even be processing the flight control inputs required to consummate that intercept. It may just take that raw data and again, through high speed data links, pump it back to some sort of uh, collection and analysis station that then determines how this missile needs to fly to consummate the intercept. And then they'll shoot that information back to the missile and it'll make updates that way. So secret aided ground guidance is the latest and greatest way. And what that provides for you when you start thinking about if I'm the missile and I'm in flight and I'm no longer tied to the site I just came from, meaning I don't need to listen to data link or radar frequencies coming from the site I just left, but I can use sites all over the countryside. Mm hmm. Right now it gives me the ability and I'm not doing that processing on board. Now it gives me the ability to fly a bunch of different flight profiles. I can do that command line of sight and drift aft, or I could stay steady on your thing. Or moreover, I could go way up high and then come down at you, or I could stay down low and then pop up at you right at the end. That's where the SAM world is heading Uh with regards to uh, technologies. And the crazy thing about that is it completely refutes the answer to my next question, which is, again, getting back to why it's so important for air crew to be professional and understand the threat, notwithstanding what you just said about the possible different patterns and paths and guidance methods. But so if I expect to see a missile constant bearing decreasing range, or I expect to see it drift back, why is it important for the crew to know that in real time, if you will? And so knowing how it's going to fly to consummate that intercept, right, will tell you if it's actually doing that, right? Uh-huh. And then if I can do something that will show, maybe it's one of those older systems, an SA-2, for instance, that is that command line of sight and will drift aft. Well, if it completely just swings aft or just picks up a straight line and keeps going straight, right? Well, I probably can bet at that point that that missile is not targeting me or I've defeated it in some way, right? Right. Uh, However, now, if I don't know because the flight path or the flight profile can change on two different missiles from the exact same system, then I have no way of identifying in the cockpit if I gain sight of that missile, if I've indeed defeated that missile and it's no longer tracking my aircraft. There you go. And that was the point I was trying to get to. And I didn't even think of it while we were talking about the launch and boost phase. But one of the other things air crew will get on, let's say, the Trans-Pacific or Atlantic part of a deployment are these little study guides. And it might even say, hey, when it launches, it'll have this giant puff of white and then a yellow rocket. And the idea is, if you go somewhere where there are multiple different types of SAMs, and you either see that or you see the guidance you described or whatever, it just gives you better situational awareness. And so if you know what kind of threat, then you know what counter tactic, which we'll have to be careful with here in a moment, but then you know what to do and you have a better chance of survival. Yes, absolutely. 
All right. And then on the constant bearing decrease in range, I think probably most people get this, but I don't know if you ever do this, Jethro. Sometimes when I'm driving and let's say I'm on a relatively straight freeway and there's a kind of a crossing road, but there'll always be like an overpass and you can see a car off to one side or the other. And it's just in that same spot on your windshield. Right. And I always look at it and I say, okay, let's see what it does. And if you would hit it, if there wasn't the overpass, then it just basically stays in that same part of your windshield. And then it gets bigger and bigger. And then at some point, then you see the line or sight as it goes up and over, as you guys get to that closer spot. But the reason I do that when I'm driving is it's almost a way of training myself. I don't do it that much anymore, but I remember when I was flying like you are that I would say, all right, well, look, that thing is just right there. In fact, there's no movement and human eyes detect movement, but you have to train yourself to say, all right, there's something there. And look, it's just in that same spot. So if there wasn't an overpass or if there wasn't, let's say a four-way stop sign, we would have a collision. And that's generally what will happen with the missile. If you don't maneuver, if you don't do something to change or defeat it, it's going to consummate the intercept. Yeah, and I think most of us actually do this. Uh, your driving idea there, your concept is probably spot on. And most of us do this already when we merge, right? When we're merging onto the highway, if that car is staying right there in the same spot in my oh, yeah. back passenger window, right, then I know I'm going to hit it. So I need to step on the gas so that it drifts further aft or I got to <laughs> slow down so it drifts further forward, right? Right, yeah. And then you use it in other parts of flying, whether it's rendezvous or, again, to avoid collisions in flight as well. So, yeah. A constant bearing decrease in range, one of those just things that probably humans use without really thinking about, especially once you're a trained driver or air crew or whatever. Okay. So what about once the missile gets where it needs to go? Let's say you have a situation like uh, Willie D. I don't know if you remember his brief. I'm sure you do. You've listened to it a few times. But he and Duke, as explained on this show way back on episode, I don't remember, nine, I think, they had their fifth kill. They were celebrating. They're heading out of country. But then suddenly there is an explosion. Does the missile actually have to physically hit you? No, it does not, actually. In fact, I remember when I talked about command line of sight, one of the problems with it is is as it gets further out, Mm -hmm. the beam width is much larger. And and so all it knows is that the target is somewhere in that very big beam width. So once the missile gets there, they want to put enough warhead and pieces, so fragmentation, to kind of cover that space. Now, that's probably unrealistic because we're talking about could be in the order of miles. But once the missile gets close enough, it has what's called proximity fuses. And those can be a variety of different things, whether it's uh, laser proximity fuses. uh, So a laser detects how close you are once you get to a preset range. Then it detonates itself. It could be an RF from a variety of different uh, radio frequencies. It could use that. It can use contact fusing, Mm -hmm. and it can also use pressure fusing. So it's one of those things where I think uh, you talked about in your AAA, which I have to say that old guys like us will always call it AAA, but as I've been corrected by my uh, Top Gun ninjas these days, the young lieutenants, it's ADA now. It's Air Defense Artillery across the board. (laughs) okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So so I constantly get corrected on that. I figure I'd share that with you. But just like when your flak has a pressure, you know, it gets to a certain altitude and then explodes, Mm -hmm. your missiles can do the same thing, whether that is a time of flight limitation, just so that, you know, you don't have this big missile raining back down, because what goes up must come down, That's right. raining back down on friendly country, or you just want to get it to a certain height and you know, hey, the aircraft that I'm going after generally don't fly above this altitude. So once you get there, you might as well explode. And that gives us the best potential of hitting it at that point kind of thing. And the warhead is going to be as you would expect. I mean, you're going to have some sort of metal that's going to fragment and create frag, I guess, uh, or you know, shrapnel almost, if is it another expression, and then the explosion itself. Because if it's close enough to an aircraft, that's going to do just fine. What I've never seen in real life, uh, tell me if you remember this scene, Jethro, from Behind Enemy Lines. You remember that rabid missile that keeps chasing <laughs> yeah. our heroes? Yeah. yeah. At the end, (laughs) instead of exploding next to them or hitting them, it fires this diabolical warhead that pierces them so that fuel trails out. And then it starts a little like trail of fire that burns up to the aircraft to blow itself up. I thought that was pretty well thought out. If we have (laughs) surface to air missiles that can do what that missile did, we're all in trouble. Uh, And whoever invented that is going to make a truckload of money. (laughs) A truckload of money. I'm not going to say that they're not diabolical things. I would say that. That particular scene is maybe a little more diabolical. I can personally attest I don't know 
I've been around this business long enough, and, and the people who come up with warheads, whether it's in a missile or in a torpedo or in a mine or on a bomb, they are some creative folks. Mm-hmm. Who knows what's in store? I think, generally speaking, though, for surface-to-air missiles, you usually either get blast frag, which is kind of what you said. So you got a high density explosive, then you're just trying to put as much little pieces of metal out into the atmosphere and the hopes that that will start to shred the aircraft. And, you know, you don't have to necessarily blow up the aircraft, right? You just take out hydraulic lines or fuel lines That's right. and there can be no huge explosion. But if the aircraft doesn't have fuel or hydraulics, then you're going to be hard pressed to fly that thing for much longer. Right. And so that's kind of the first type of warhead you'd have. The second type of warhead is what's called expanding continuous rod. Same concept, but instead of having a bunch of little bitty pieces of metal going out, you're actually going to have very long rods that while they don't stay attached to each other, are close enough that it becomes essentially attached to each other, and it's like an expanding ring. And those are usually used on your bigger aircraft. What you're trying to do is just sever off large pieces of that aircraft so it can no longer become flyable. Yeah. Well, aircraft in general are pretty fragile in that regard. I mean, they'll have redundant systems, but if a warhead gets close enough, then you're going to really have a problem. And again, I know you've heard Willie D's talk at Top Gun, and he was on the show, and he talks about, in fact, in his brief, he brings prepared a little cup of some sort with some tinfoil over it real tight, and he takes a pen or pencil, and he just pokes holes in it. And he talks about that was the sound that he heard, but of course, multiple times over in a split second. But the warhead was close enough that the frag came out and, and yeah, to your point, severed their hydraulic system. And in their case, they were lucky to at least have enough to get feet wet and ultimately rescued. But all you got to do is burden the aircraft so it can't fly anymore. And you've accomplished your mission as a SAM. Absolutely. All right. And then in some cases, like with fingers on the show, uh, he was in the back of an F4 and it frankly killed the pilot. So that works too, as tragic as that is, and, and maimed him in his hand. But then, like you said, yeah, you could have catastrophic connection with a contact fuse or just in close enough proximity that if the fuel detonates, then again, it's done its job. All right. So knowing all that, and again, being mindful of not getting you in trouble since you're still on active duty, what are some different ways? And we've kind of hinted at some of these already, but what are some different ways that we can make sure these SAMs don't do their jobs? Yeah. So number one is just avoid them, right? <laughs> that's, exactly. That's number one on everybody's list, uh, but not always possible because the enemy gets a vote, right? Mm-hmm. If it's probably important enough to bomb, it's probably important enough for the enemy to defend. And surface-to-air missiles are, in a, a lot of ways, cheaper than an Air Force, right? So yeah. if you can't avoid them, then what do you do, right? Then you, you know, hope to suppress them, right? And you can suppress them in a variety of different ways. You can have cyber as, as one you know way to suppress it. You can have have electronic attack. Uh, you can have another strike that's specific to that SAM site, if you know mm-hmm. what it's about, uh, hinting back to our discussion on mobility and positioning of those sites. Yep. You could do things internally with your own aircraft to make it harder for that site to actually detect you. <laughs> Very delicately put, thank you. So there's things you can do there in order to suppress that system's ability to either detect you at all or to, once it detects you, develop that fire control solution. So that handoff from the very early warning system to the actual, I have a target that I am satisfied with that I can consummate an intercept on, Mm -hmm. you know, and then I don't want to say everything is airborne either because, you know, we got plenty of people doing plenty of things on the ground. So maybe you just have your army unit come in there and shell the location, right? And that probably keeps the guys in their bunkers and not in their open radar van, right? So, Mm -hmm. So that could also do it as well. So there's a variety of ways of trying to suppress that thing. It it takes a lot of coordination with some of those outside agencies. Some of it is internal, but a lot of it is external. And quite frankly, that's uh, where we as the U.S. kind of exceed, right, is in that joint operations. Because while we like to say it, and I know I made fun of it a lot when I was younger, that is a a definite advantage uh, that we have is uh, the ability to combine in both time and space uh, different effects on the battlefield to get done what you need to get done. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, if none of that works and there's one coming at you, then you always got the good old stick and throttle, don't you? Yeah, stick and throttle. Then it comes down (laughs) to doing some of that pilot stuff, right? (laughs) That's right. And we also have expendables we can put out, which helps. We do. We have uh, chaff and flare, the common ones I think everybody is familiar with. So flare generally 
generally speaking, for those IR missiles, so the man pads in the SAM world, the IR air-to-air missiles in the air-to-air mm-hmm. world. So you have flares for that, and then you also have chaff, which uh, looks to disrupt the RF tracking, the radio frequency tracking, Mm -hmm. the radar tracking of the missile. And again, that would work. You can either defeat the tracker, so the radar site that is actually tracking you, or you can defeat the missile seeker head if it is one of those that uses that, right? Obviously, it does you no good versus a missile if it's doing command line of sight, but if it's semi-active or active missile, then your chaff can work on both the radar site and the radar missile that's coming at you. So long story short, hundreds of things, maybe not that many, but you know, dozens of things have to all transpire correctly for enemy aircraft to be downed by uh, SAM. I'm kind of taking it from their point of view now, right? If any one of those things is interrupted or disrupted, then it's not going to work, whether it's yeah. the detection, the launch, the engagement, the consummation, or even right at the very, very end, these are great big missiles and they do have good maneuverability, but sometimes the initiative is all you need. And if you can make a last ditch maneuver with your aircraft and the missile just doesn't like the old puppy right on the wet linoleum floor, (laughs) there's just not much you can do at that last second. Yep, absolutely. And I think Hollywood does a good job of coming up with behind middle enemy line missiles, right? That can fly forever. <laughs> but the intricacy and the complexity of finding, you know, an aircraft in a big piece of sky and then directing a very uh, smaller missile onto that aircraft. Mm-hmm. It's no small task, and that's why we train to it, but that's why our enemy trains to it as well. And so yeah. it's a complex ballet of 15 different parts that move probably in a course that takes sometimes very short, two, two minutes, but sometimes very long, 15 minutes. And so if you can mm-hmm. interrupt any of those little things in there, then they have to start all over. And you don't even have to interrupt them. You can just delay them sometimes, and then you fly beyond their ability to reach out and touch you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Jethro, uh, I was reminded of a story that Brett Crozier told at my retirement. You remember Chopper? Yeah. He was my guest speaker. And apparently we were flying one night over Iraq in 2003. And I vaguely remember this, but we're flying along and they had always said, if you see anything, let us know. And we look over and of course we're on night vision goggles and here goes this ballistic SAM up. And we were just kind of holding. We weren't really doing anything exciting. And so I can't remember if he called it or I called it. But to your point about Hollywood, it wasn't at all what you might expect. We literally (laughs) looked over, and uh, I think according to his story at my retirement, he called it out because I looked over and I just said, cool. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, it was pretty clear that we weren't being targeted. It was far away. It was just going straight up. It was ballistic. And so uh, I evidently, he was relatively new to the Hornet at that time. Uh, He was in his very first assignment, even though he was a young 04, but I was the training officer because he had converted from helicopters. I guess maybe I let him down. He was expecting a little bit more, but (laughs) just in that moment when I saw it and we weren't really hyped up for the game, we were just patrolling, but I looked over and I said, cool, all right, no big deal. And then we got back and we reported. And I think we got an extra point towards an air medal for that. So that's my limited experiences with SAMs. And as I've already mentioned, we've had some guests on this show that have had quite a bit more harrowing experiences with SAMs. But as I understand, did you have a run in with a SAM or two at some point? Yeah, before I start that one, I, I want to go back because Crunch was telling his story about ADA. You know, uh-huh. in 2001, I was uh, lucky enough to participate in uh, the very opening week of OEF. Oh, wow. And we actually performed the first attacks to Mazar al Sharif, which is way up north, if you remember that. And so we go up there as a section of Tomcats, uh, but we only had one FLIR pod on board with the flight of two. And that FLIR pod was on my aircraft. So we go to the airfield and we had some targets we were destroying the airfield. Well, the airfield is geographically separated from the actual town by a couple of miles. Let's call it seven or eight or 10, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. So we pick up an orbit overhead, you know, we're full blackout. Out, everything's going fine and dandy. We pick out a target. It's this uh, juicy transport aircraft that's in the line of three. So we're going to hit one and it's going to take three out. It's beautiful. It's all set up. It's perfect. Uh-huh. And so we line up, buddy bomb. Everything goes off perfect. Shh, bomb goes down, lazing. Everything perfect, perfect, perfect. And then the bomb duds. Oh. And you're like, ah. Oh. I'm dead. And so we're like, well, let's do it again. Now we're going to drop it. You know, same thing. We'll, we know that plane is hit because it actually shacked the plane. It just didn't go high order. So we're going to move shift to the next plane over. Uh-huh. But at about 
I don't know, call it 15 or 20 seconds after the dud hits, the town of Mazar al Sharif just lights up in my version of Baghdad, you know, whenever, 1999, whichever one, right? And it just goes up and I just see tracer rounds and they're going all over the place, crazy shooting everywhere. And I look over there and I'm like, huh? What are they shooting at? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds. I'm like, oh, they're shooting at us. And I was like, and that was from a dud. Wow, it must be really quiet up here. And it was one of those things where they couldn't get to us, right? It's all tracer fire. Oh, yeah. Light ADA, as I've been told these days. That's right. Yeah. And so we're like, all right, let's just not fly over there. We'll stay here. That light show lasted for about five minutes. We ended up doing about six runs. Everything else went high order, uh, very successful at that point. But that was my run in. And as Crunch was relaying his story, it's like, ah, man, it sounds so familiar because it did the exact same thing. <laughs> so, That's crazy. That was the first one. So, I, you know, you just got a sense of like, okay, they're not going to touch me. So even though I was very young, I was very young, less than what, six months in the squadron at that point, wow. there wasn't any fear at that point for me, but fast forward now, my second half of my JO tour 2003. So that was 2001, 2003. I'm now in the super Hornet now with VFA 41. We actually fly from the Nimitz, which was over in the Pacific and we fly into the Gulf to join the fight because of a variety of reasons I won't bore you. But about five days into it, they're going to make the big first push into Baghdad proper. And I don't know how you were, Jello, but I'm generally not a glove wearer in the cockpit. I prefer the dexterity that I can have with my fingers. Yeah, I used to just cut the fingertips on mine. So I used yeah. to wear them. But, yeah. That's a smart okay. way of doing business. <laughs> we're flying in, we're checking in. And in this mission, I bring up the fact that we flew off one carrier and landed on the other to let you know that now we're the first F 18Fs in combat, period, dot. Mm -hmm. And we're flying off the wing of an F 14D. So that's who we get paired up with. And the ATO planners in their. Um, all their majesty decided to pair us up as a section, but then give us two different call signs. Oh, uh, so, so it just made it that much more difficult. Uh, so we're proceeding in countries, standard stuff, you know, we hit our tanker and we go in and then we talk to our, uh, they didn't have JTACs at the time, but it was essentially our TAC P representative. Okay. And the guy comes up on the radio and I'll never forget. And he goes, Hey, I want you to go to the north side of the big city, you know the one I'm talking about, and you're going to do east-west legs on the north side of the city, and anything firing from the inside of the city to the outside of the city, you're cleared to employ on. And I'm like, all right. I'm like, well, that's pretty liberal, but okay. Yeah. So again, not a glove wearer. I was like, mm, I'm going to take out my gloves and put them on. So this day, I actually <laughs> took out my gloves and put them on. And we were still learning the Super Hornet, and I will tell you that I felt safer in the Super Hornet in respect of uh, the EW suite was more reliable and a little more advanced than the Tomcat. Now, the Tomcat had more fuel and could go faster, so there was trade-offs back and forth. Oh, yeah. But I felt more comfortable with knowing what was targeting me and what wasn't in the Super Hornet. So we go up and do exactly what our TACP representative told us to do, and we fly, and we, uh, I don't know, a whole tank of gas, essentially. We flew for a whole tank of gas, nothing, not a single bit of ground fire, nothing. I'm like, how could this be? We're about to make the big push in. And then as we're making our last leg, and, and so our tanker's on the west side of the big town, and so we got to go back around the town because we can't fly over the top of it. Still technically a super mess. Okay. So we're going to fly around it to go hit our tanker. And so our lead, who's the Tomcat D, he looks down. He's like, hey, okay, last lap. We'll head back to the uh, west here. Uh, we'll do one last check into the big city proper, and then we'll depart for AR. Like, sounds good. So, you know, we're making our final swing through east, turn through north, back through west. So we start looking in, and about that time, our lead, Tomcat, starts calling out missiles. He's like, one missile in the air. And I'm, I look, turn to my uh, pilot. Do you know Gerbs? Yeah. Gerbs is my pilot, Gerbs Wagon uh -huh. I'm like, do you see anything? He's like, no, I don't see anything. Well, first, what I said is, what did he say? <laughs> that was my first question. He goes, I think he said missiles in the air. And I looked around, like, I don't see anything. So then he starts calling out. He's like, two missiles in the air, three missiles in the air. And he's like, seven missiles in the air. And I don't, I don't see anything. 
And I'm like, holy cat. So I call for the appropriate SAM maneuver at that point when you don't have any missiles in sight or there are multiple missiles airborne. Now, mind you, we didn't have a peep on my EW system. So again, I told you I felt pretty comfortable. Uh Nothing indicating that we're a target, but our lead's calling it out and we don't see them. I've been trained by Top Gun. This is what we do, right? So we do it. (laughs) That's about the last time I followed any recommendation appropriately for the rest of this flight. The rest of it was a mere miracle that we made it through. Yeah. We do the appropriate maneuvers, which, as you know, can cause you to bleed some kinematic energy yes. away. So we're at that point. We stop when we're like, okay, we still don't see anything. Our systems are not telling us anything. We probably sacrificed enough for what we've done. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, that's good. And as at about that time, as we're doing the appropriate maneuver, we were the first air crew as well to have the helmet, oh. right? And as if you remember from your time, where the helmet attaches to the actual jet and that hinge and that big blocky piece of gear that they put on your uh, harness. I never actually had the joint helmet, but I'm familiar. All right. So there's a big blocky piece there and Uh it needs to be put in a very specific location. And then you need to wrap your cords in a very specific location that we learned the hard way. Because if you don't, when you move that block catches your oxygen in your comm cord and can undo it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. That's not good. Right. As we're whipping our head around to look for the missiles that we don't see and our systems are not telling us, and we're performing the appropriate maneuvers, my pilot's helmet block catches it and now he becomes disconnected so he can no longer talk or more importantly breathe oxygen (laughs) so we level out Uh, i'm hearing the broken hey okay wait what i'm like what is going on and he's like hey jethro i can't breathe my oxygen hose keeps going undone and i'm like all right so we're worried about that and about that time that's when our ew our electronic warfare system started talking to us and so we got the i'm going to do a very poor rendition but we've got the the very initial tones of, hey, some radar is looking at you. You might want to think about this. Uh And so, you know, but we're worried about him not being able to breathe at this time. (laughs) That's the more immediate threat. (laughs) That's the more immediate threat. And so the system's like, hey, look at me. Look at me. And, you know, and that's it. And you're like, okay, well, it stops saying look at me uh, in its own particular tones. Right. And so my pilot, Gerbs, gets his hose connect back in. And now we got to find where our wingman is and all that. And then the system says, no, look at me now. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? And so I guess we got to look. And about that time, at about my 10 o'clock, two huge, uh, it was at night and we're on goggle, two huge Roman candle shots come out from about my 10 o'clock position. Boom, boom. They come up and you're like, huh, what are those? And we're like, it's sort of like you, like, right? When you first see it, you're like, huh, what are those doing? Where are they going? Uh, well, they came up and then they got to our altitude and you're like, whoa, where are they going? And then they pointed directly at us. Uh, and then it became very clear that they were coming for us. Wow. Yeah. I break into my best rendition of a 12 year old school girl <laughs> and start screaming at poor Gerbs to move the jet. Uh-huh. But of course we had already moved the jet a little bit. And so we had sacrificed some of our capabilities. And, and I should say that at this time we were carrying two 1000 pound bombs okay. and three external tanks. So we were a five wet super Hornet at that point. So okay. not the best when it comes to maneuverability. So now here are two definite missiles definitely heading our way. We quickly run out of options based off of configuration. Like I said, we do not follow Top Gun recommendations at this point. So we keep everything (laughs) on the jet. We also do not maintain our chaff flare discipline. Okay. So we're both putting out chaff and flare at the same time, which just means (laughs) we're pumping it out doubly fast at this point. Okay. And so we run out of chaff and flare, but I didn't realize it at the time. So in our maneuvers, we get to the point where we're like, okay, we're going to have to do exactly what you talked about is in the end game. Uh How do you defeat these things so that they don't blow up on your aircraft in the maneuver that we choose to perform? We end up upside down. And so we're upside down with these missiles continue to track on us. And that's when we get the light in the cockpit. That's the master caution light, which I'm sure your viewers will know as, Hey, there's something really wrong with your jet. (laughs) <laughs> with the master. And so uh, I'm upside down. The master caution light comes on and I'm staring at two missiles that are constant range 
decreasing bearing on us at this point. Constant range or constant? Constant bearing, decreasing range. Okay. Yes. Constant bearing, decreasing range on us. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, "Hmm, so this is how I'm going to go. Really? (laughs) I do. Wow. Time slowed down. Uh, So we looked down It ended up that the master caution ended up being a nuisance caution and not a big deal. So that was good. Oh, great. We do an appropriate enough maneuver that now our electronic warfare suite tells us the missiles aren't looking at us anymore. And I look out and visually see that the missiles are no longer pointing at us, but it appears they have broken lock. And now they are no longer pointing directly at us, but rather pointing up in the sky. So they're actually flying up and over. And I, and once I see that they're no longer pointed at us, I quit looking. So I don't know if they went up there and exploded or just went out up there and fizzled out. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I was just happy that this part of the <laughs> exercise was over. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, exercise, good grief. That's right. Oh, man, yeah. So so we, we scoop it out. Now, mind you, I told you that we had spent the whole previous bit doing east-west legs for a whole tank of gas. So this is happening mm-hmm. when we're out of gas. So we look down. We're in basically the center part of our east-west running legs, which were about 25 miles in length. We're pointed north. We're at an altitude and airspeed that is not very desirable, thinking back to what Crunch talked about with, hey, they do this to beat you down to this, to beat you down to that, right? That's not very desirable. And then it is just dead silence in the cockpit, except for two people breathing very heavy. (laughs) So Gerbs is the first to break the silence, and he's like, hey, Jethro, just look back there, because I'm going to stroke the burners a little bit so that we can start to get back to an altitude and airspeed we want to be at. Like, uh-huh. okay, go for it. I'm feeling pretty good about this. <laughs> then I'm looking at, okay, how much gas do we have? Answer, not a lot. And where we are and where our wingman is. Well, the Tomcat, mind you, Tomcat D, so big motor Tomcat, they saw all the missiles and they did what the Tomcat does best and they poured it on. Uh-huh. And so I looked down and uh, now I'm using my data link and I'm like, hmm. My wingman is 20 miles away from me. (laughs) (laughs) And fast. (laughs) That's right. Fast and high and not where we want to. So so I'm like, ah. Yeah, where we'd like to be. So we finally get done with that. The first voice on the radio is the uh, guy who's monitoring the frequency from the ground perspective. So our TACP representative. And he's like, butt kiss. That was our call sign. Butt kiss one, two. Are you still with us? And do you know, do you know where that missile came from? <laughs> and at that point, I am like, I have no idea what I said on the radio over ICS or whatever, but they somehow knew we were in a world, a world of hurt. <laughs> and we're like, we're fine. We're going to AR now. Things are good. And they're like, hey, just can you tell us where it is? Because we got some F-15s who are going to take your place. And they just like to know where that is. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> it's in this general location of the big town, but I, I can't pinpoint it for you. And they're like, all right, good <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> and so just to top it all off, and I'll make a long story even longer, we get to the tanker. Our wingman's already there because he's in the Tomcat going super fast, right? right. So he backs out because he's already gotten some gas. We back in to the fill up because we're about to divert. We fill up, and now our Tomcat buddy has got to finish up getting the rest of his gas. He gets in there, dings his probe, but doesn't know it. We think the tanker goes sour, so we go find another tanker. He can't tank off of that one. So now the Tomcat has to bingo in to Kuwait. So he does a bingo profile, and we're like, hey, we can't hang with you configured the way we are. Uh-huh. So he goes to the moon fast and bingos in to Kuwait. And now we're a single, (laughs) we're a single, which we've been most of the time anyway. So not a huge deal, but we're a single (laughs) and Gerbs and I have a heart to heart and we're like, Hey, um, judging on how many flares and chaff we have left. And the answer was zero. We can't go back to where we were. And we agreed to that. And we were like, but we still got two good bombs. So if they're somewhere else and we talked ourselves into it, so we did some radio fishing, found a frequency that was uh, where they needed some work in a low, low threat environment, went and dropped their bombs, two shacks. Nice. <laughs> and then went back home for the okay uh, night three. And, that, <laughs> and we made it home and the Tomcat didn't because they were diverted into, oh, into Kuwait. Goodness. And I say that with uh, nothing but love because as you know, I started out as a Tomcat. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. So yeah, that was my story. And then trust me, I, I went back and 
talked it over, and the best I could figure was an SA-6 okay. that shot at us. And then I thought for the longest time, I have no idea why the missiles quit tracking on us. Was it the fact that our chaff worked on SA-6, obviously semi-active radar guided? You know, the Iraqis were pretty savvy when it comes to harm. So did the radar operators just get scared because they knew, hey, I've been radiating for X amount of time. I need to shut off or there's potential that I'm going to get hit. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Was it the maneuver that we did? I don't know. And it wasn't until recently, just recently, uh, here, what, some 15 years later that I was talking to Gerbs about it. And he's like, no, I was putting out flares. And I was like, huh? And he's like, yeah, I was putting out flares. So I think it was one of those Frankenstein missiles that the Iraqis were putting together. And that was a SA-6 missile with an IR seeker slapped onto it, Frankenstein-wise. And when it got close, the flares are what actually drew the IR seeker away from us and caused mm. the missiles to miss. To this day, I don't know. Could be all three. Could be none of those. I don't know. I'm just glad they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either way, it had the desired end state. Yeah. Yes. That is quite the story, Jethro. Uh, butt kiss is a really unfortunate call sign. It is. Uh, <laughs> and then you said TACP a couple of times. We all know that as the Tactical Air Control Party. So the folks on the ground, we had an episode, a, a couple actually talking about that. And then I guess I didn't pick up on this earlier and darn my fading memory. I was on Nimitz in 03 and 41 was in the air wing. Had you already gone to Top Gun at that point? Were we at Top Gun together? I had not gone to Top Gun at that point. Oh, okay. uh, I was an avid Top Gun reader. Gotcha. I knew all the procedures, but when uh, push came to shove, I managed to get one of like the five things you needed to do right. And it was at the very <laughs> beginning. And then when I went to brainstem, I, uh, yeah. I did everything else wrong from that point. I think you said this, but so I remember the Nimitz forward deployed, if you will, a handful of rhinos to what, the Lincoln or something? Did you say that? So were you one of those guys? Yeah, I was one of those guys. Absolutely. So that when we got there a little later on Nimitz, you guys had some corporate knowledge and a bit more by the your story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So when we got there and you came back to Nimitz, then you guys had some corporate knowledge on the, the routes in and out and the threats and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. All right. Cool. That was a good deployment. So yeah, that was the same one. It must have ended quickly because I think by the time we got there, it was pretty benign, which I think is why my reaction that night with Chopper was, I wasn't feeling too threatened. But on the other hand, they weren't coming at me either, that one. Flash in the pan, right? I got there six days. I flew six days straight on the Lincoln. I was there for a total of seven days. And then it was like we did a two-day turnover, I think. And within those eight days, it went from full-on press to nothing happening, essentially. Yeah. Don't remind me. I'm still bitter about that. Yeah. <laughs> the Iraqis folded pretty quick once we made the press yeah. into Baghdad proper. Yeah. I think when we got there and flew our first missions was right when the statue was coming down in some square in Baghdad. And that was almost like the beginning of the end. So I recall, I think Lincoln had what VFA 115 was an E squadron. And that was the first deployment yeah. of the Rhino. So you guys were the first two seat to head over there and get some. Yeah. And part of the reason for going there, right? If you remember correctly, our four Rhinos, two E's, two F's that left from CAG 11 yep. uh, were all five-way configured. And so we flew there. Uh, and one of the reasons to get there, right, was the Navy wanted to get more organic tanking in theater because we just couldn't get enough gas uh keep the sortie count the way they wanted. So that was one reason. The second reason was that they wanted more FAC A's, which was weird because I was a FAC A crew. So we sent two FAC A crews, but then we ended up not doing any more FAC A's. I think maybe that was a selling point. Huh. And then uh, the AT FLIR, they wanted to get the AT FLIR into the fight because 115 had AT FLIRs, but they were LRIP ones and they weren't, for whatever reason, certified for combat. So we actually brought four AT FLIRs in there. So they were probably dropping a lot of JDAM, and LRIP is a what low rate initial production, so almost like prototypes. Prototypes, you bet. And then uh, they were going into country with the older T FLIRs if they were doing any sort of laser bombing, and those weren't quite as capable as the AT FLIR. And so they wanted to get the AT FLIR in, and so we did that. And so yeah. very interesting first Fs the the going country, and then I had the pleasure of being the first. F crew to drop a laser guided bomb using the AT FLIR. So the first air crew to drop an LGB in combat and the first crew to use the AT FLIR in combat. We have celebrities here on the fighter pilot. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Don't be prepared to make a million dollars off of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're going to be in Hollywood when you get done with this uh, 
speaking of that, what does, as we begin thinking about wrapping up, what does the future hold for you? You're, you're still playing the game. Yeah, uh, so just uh, been decagging, so deputy air wing commander for about two and a half months now, two months. Uh, so I still got uh, 16 more months of the, doing that job uh, and learning the ropes. And hopefully if uh, everything goes well, and as my grandfather used to say, the creek don't rise, then I'll get to move over into the cag seat and take over for me and with carrier wing seven. So I'm excited about the opportunities that lie ahead. Oh, I have no doubts you'll do just fine short of something you can't control. But uh, yeah, that's good stuff. And so you guys are going to be out there doing it. You could be right back in a situation like this, brother. Could be. That is very true. I, I kept this one close to the vest. Only uh, only a handful of my closest friends know about this. We'll, we'll just may let the cat out of the bag just a touch on this one. But oh, yeah. We don't have very many listeners, so don't feel bad about it. And <laughs> to your earlier point about the things we do or don't do after we leave Top Gun, you know, because we've had a yeah. show on Top Gun and how the recommendations and all that. And I've always wondered, you know, maybe now that you and I are a little bit removed, we should encourage them to create a like a little tiger team that goes around and like if you don't do what you're supposed to do they steal your patch like you're done (laughs) (laughs) if they could do it retroactively they would come back and like oh we we heard the podcast and uh jetha we're gonna need that patch back (laughs) first they're gonna take me back to a a room where we can talk about everything and they're like like, you did what yeah what did you do and then you did what and then you (laughs) didn't do what yeah we're gonna need that patch back we can't have that out in the open. <laughs> we have that men in black little pen. That's right. That's right. The little flashy red thing. And it'll be like it never happened. <laughs> Let's hope they don't do that because I, it's hard. As you probably know, it's hard to keep up. With I didn't even know about aircraft. Uh, what'd you call it? ADA? Is- yeah, ADA. Yeah, air defense artillery. That was a big one for me. They're like, no, you can't say AAA anymore. It's ADA. And I was like, Really? You know, what's funny. By the time people hear this, they're going to say, what do you mean, Jello? You were talking about it on the last episode. Well, I haven't recorded the rest of that yet, folks. So there's a bit of a time warp here because now I'm learning about this. But yeah, we'll use this for crunches uh, coming into your episode. So, so you're going to love this one too, uh, Jello. They brought back the urns so you can say Northern and Southern again. So we're trying to align with the Air Force as we, again, talking about jointness. Uh-huh. We ended up getting more than we gave when it came to the also Com Brevity Manual. But one of the things we gave on was urns. So Northern and Southern or Western and Eastern are all back on the table now. Get, get, that one's hard for me. Yeah, uh, give the listener a quick 30 second elevator speech on what that means and why we fought for not using it. <laughs> so, com brevity uh, across the spectrum is a big deal, obviously, when you're in a fight, when you're dodging SAMs, or when you're in an air to air fight, or in a large force strike mm-hmm. where everybody's trying to talk and trying to pass information. Radio time is a precious commodity. So, if you can say one or two words or even one or two syllables that convey a whole host of meetings such that now everybody knows if I just say one or two syllables and everybody knows exactly what to do based off of that. Now that gives somebody else the radio time that they can provide additional situational awareness that will keep us all safe or make the flight or the uh, mission that more effective. And so for the longest time, naval aviation, I don't want to say sloppy because that's doing a disservice to all those that came before us. There was not much standardization. And as we rolled into the standardization process, there was a large push to stomp out the urns and the ings, meaning I'm shooting the northern guy, I'm shooting north, I'm shooting the southern guy, or I'm targeting, no, you're just target. So it's one less syllabus, but if you if you add those up over time, it starts to pay dividends. And so there was a huge push to stomp that out, to get rid of that one syllable. And there was a lot of friction, as there always is, just like me complaining about AAA changing to ADA. <laughs> People who brought up saying urns and ings, uh, northern, didn't like just saying north. They preferred saying northern. And so we had to push and fought that fight and finally got it stamped out. And that was the culture. And then here we are today. <laughs> back to it and there's some old aviators some definitely some old tomcatters rolling over or uh feeling like a knife is being stabbed right in their back right now uh, uh, for what we've done but but all in the name of jointness so 
Well, and that's the point, right? Is we made a compromise like, hey, look, all right, fine. We'll say earn again if you'll do this. And they say, okay. And so it's a compromise. Uh, people in Washington, D.C. should listen to us uh, in that regard. <laughs> Let's not go on a tangent. But to your point, right? UPS trucks try not to do left turns because they sit and wait at a light or for traffic. And while that makes a minuscule difference in that one truck's fuel across a fleet of thousands and thousands of UPS trucks, it adds up. And so that's why they try not to make left turns. So to your point, North group, Northern group, two syllables, three syllables. Well, enough of that can make a difference, but yeah, I mean, it's somewhat debate the, I don't know, importance of that. And it sounds like it was a trade-off Top Gun was willing to make. Yeah, absolutely. And I, like I said, I think we got more than we uh, gave up yeah, yeah. Uh, out of that, which is good. So, And again, getting us in the Air Force on board because uh, wherever we go now, fighting our peer adversaries, you know, we're going to need the Air Force and they're going to need us and right. we're going to need be able to talk the same language so that we can uh, truly defeat our foes. So, so I'm on board with it. It uh, doesn't mean I'm good at it, but I'm on board and I'll keep trying. Well, that's the latest. Let's hope it doesn't change again because then people will really be confused. But at any rate, I want to be respectful of your time here and start wrapping this up. Thomas Bodine, Jethro. I mean, I've been scratching my head all week on this one, Jethro. I don't know if I can figure out how your call sign came to be. Yeah, so uh, I'm from Alabama. And uh, early on in my naval career, I had a much thicker accent than I do (laughs) right now. And, it's pretty thick uh, right now. Yeah, it was, uh, on purpose. And so being from Alabama and still having people who watch the Beverly Hillbillies, then Jethro Bodine mm-hmm. is the cousin on the Beverly Hillbillies. So you've got right. Jed Clampett. So it was nothing more than a convenient last name and a thicker Southern accent. Interestingly enough, it's generational though. So now I judge people because most times the younger kids don't know Beverly Hillbillies. And so they actually ask me if I'm a fan of NCIS, which I have not watched that show, but apparently the lead character on it is Jethro something. Okay. And so they're like, Hey, are you a big NCIS fan? Is that why your call sign is Jethro? And I'm like Beverly Hillbillies. And they just give me the doe eyes. It's a new generation now. So yeah. I'm suddenly having a crisis of conscience. Uh, had I been saying your last name wrong? Do you pronounce it Bodine? Bodine, Bodine, either way. It's, uh... All right, Jethro, this is a lot of fun. What did I not ask you about Sam's that we should cover before we hang up? No, nah, I think we hit it all. Hopefully uh, you got what you needed. Oh, this is great. And I know the listeners will love the discussion and you as well. And so as much as we can, we'll try to keep in touch with you. We're not going to ask you when you're deploying, but when you do, let us know how you're doing from time to time. And when you get back, how it went. And and, I really appreciate your time today. All right. Thanks, man. Had a blast. All right. Big thanks again to Captain Thomas Bodine. Bodine, I guess he doesn't care, but I'll try to get it right. Jethro, that was awesome. He's still out there playing the game and doing this good work. Man, I don't know. Crunch, you said it at the top. It was a pretty exciting interview and it passes quickly. It does. It was great. So here's something I need your help on. And I struggled through it and uh, Jethro didn't really let me off the hook. How do I distinguish, not the concepts, I get the concepts, but what's the terminology between missile guidance? And I'm thinking like, is it tracking me with a radar? Is it tracking my IR, et cetera? Mm. But also the path that it flies, which is sort of its guidance, but not really. Yeah. How did you used to teach that? Or how would you clarify that? That's a great question, Jello. So I think what you're, you're asking is, what's the difference between how does the radar tell the missile where to go? Or how does the missile know where to go versus how does it fly through space? right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And what does it look like from my point of view? Well, let's take that old SA-2 first, the old, uh, you know, 1950s era, former Soviet Union SA-2 flying telephone pole. It had a radar that it tracked the airplane and then it illuminated you with tracking radar, you know, radar waveform that bounces off of your airplane, comes back, hits that source radar. And then as the missile is launching, it's data linking commands to that missile and saying, here's where you go. And it all has to stay in the same scan volume. And so it's all kind of just pointing at each other. Well, imagine this. You have a lot of European listeners, I think. So let's talk in the terms of European football. So everybody knows what's going on. Soccer, as we say here. If you are running down the field and I want to cut you off and grab that soccer ball, I'm going to have to run out in front of you in order to meet you down the field. If I just run straight at you, I am never going to actually catch you if we're flying the same speed. And matter of fact, as I just keep running at you, 
I am slowly just going to drift behind you before, you know, you and I are just running front and back down the field, even though we started next to each other. Right. And that's what the SA2 and SA3 are doing is they're just basically running straight at you for lack of a better term, not exactly, but that's an easy way to think of it. So if you are that soccer player out in front and you see off to the left, there's the other player and he's trying to get you and he's just running straight at you. As you run down towards the goal, he is slowly going to continue to drift aft and aft and aft. Even if he's faster than you, he will eventually catch you, but he's continued to drift aft on your shoulder as you're running down the field. And that's what that old command line of sight missile would do. On the other hand, if he's a smart player and he's trying to cut you off on that as you're running towards the goal, you're running towards the goal, he's off to your left, and he is running out in front of you, you might be looking over there. And that's when you hear what Jethro was talking about, constant bearing, decreasing range, meaning he is just to your left 930 the whole time, and he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know he's eventually going to hit you. And so he's that same spot in your canopy. That thing is flying a lead pursuit curve, and it is tracking you and going to get you. Okay. I think that's what you were asking. Is that true? Yeah, basically. I mean, in other words, so in your first example, the way the missile is guided is by semi-active radiation homing, right? Uh, in some cases. So you're illuminating the target and it's picking up the radar reflected energy. Others might use their own radar. Others might use an IR seeker. Mm -hmm. But the point is there's a difference between what's happening in the seeker and the flight path of the missile. And for some reason, I confuse those two concepts as if they're necessarily tied, but I don't think they are. One is mm. one is what is it using to guide on the weapon, and the other is what is the flight path it's following to do so. Yeah, right. So it, okay. exactly. So let's talk, think about an SA-6, for example. Uh, SA-6, three fingers of death, it's a track vehicle with uh, three missiles on the top and a separate vehicle that has the radar. So as the missile is flying downrange, the radar sight is illuminating the target. The radar wave is bouncing off of the target and being received by the missile seeker head in flight. It's going to see that. And the missile with the computer in the seeker head is going to tell it where to fly. Okay. And now it goes shooting out in front and basically flies that lead pursuit where it tries to intercept out in front instead of just flying straight at you. Yeah. That's one of those cases where it's going to be constant position in your canopy as it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you go boom. All right. And then, of course, at the end, he talked about some of those calm brevity changes that we touched on before we even listened. But again, it comes down to, I don't know, it's a lot like a relationship. I mean, if a husband and a wife agree that they want to move forward together, but they have different opinions on things, sometimes you got to make compromises and it's not always what you would choose, but that's how you move forward. I mean, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but sometimes the Air Force gets their way. Sometimes we get our way and hopefully in the end, we all work better together, even if it's maybe not the exact way we'd like to do it. That's right. In the end, you know, as with all things in life, change is hard. Even if it's change for the good, sometimes you just don't want to. Yeah. And you just get grumpy about it because you're like, look, I've spent the last 15 years doing it this way. Why do I need to change? Because you don't want to you don't want to change, you know, <laughs> when. So <laughs> let's be honest. A lot of times that's what it is. You know, yes, those urns and inks can add up over time, but we used to do it. We'll live. Yeah. And I found I don't know about for you, but as I grew longer in the tooth, it just got harder for me to remember what was new and what was old. And so if Northern came back for me, I would start using it, but then I would forget. And then I would say, well, which way did I forget? Did I forget that it's back or that it's not there? And so I guess that's why yeah. flying fighters is a young man sport. Well, that, and so you guys, in your interview, you and Jethro were talking about how, hey, you know, after a certain period of time, they should go out and tighten up the Top Gun instructors again. You remember talking about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I tell you, I don't know if you remember Snap Courtney. He was a Top Cat Rio ahead of us in, at the Top Gun lineage there. But he used to have a saying, he would say, you know, that there should be a Top Gun hit squad. And so after about three to five years after you've left the school, <laughs> they should send out a hit team and take you out because now you are just damaging the brand and you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's changed. It has changed. And you're calling it North instead of Northern. No, it's back again. Yeah. So he was obviously joking because uh, either that or I'm really fast and I avoided the hit team. So there we are. Very good. Well, maybe you retired in time. You did too. I did, yep. barely. I guess I should clarify for anyone who might think I meant it literally, a young person's business this is, not mm. just a young mm. man's. It used to be back in World War II and Vietnam, but increasingly mm. it is, of course, mixed gender and race. So anything else on the uh, interview, Crunch? And uh, I thought it was really good. It wasn't his SME subject like it was yours, but I thought he represented well. 
Yeah, I thought that was absolutely great. He talked about, uh, I tell you, he should go give my old lecture. That was a really great <laughs> discussion to talk about entertaining. Yeah. I got to go call Gerbs now and find out what's going on. I've never heard that story from his point either. <laughs> Excellent. That was a great story. Awesome. All right. Before we wrap up today, I want to share with you a new podcast I recently discovered. It's called Harry. It's about real life stories told by people who live them. And it's founded and hosted by Matt Graves, who joins us today to tell us more. How's it going, Matt? Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, You're welcome. All right. So tell us about this podcast, Harry, spelled H-A-I-R-Y. Yeah, it's a funny name, isn't it? Well, Harry's a six-episode dramatic podcast, and season one is actually called Death in the Sky, and it's about air combat experiences in the Vietnam War. And the goal is to try to bring the listener into the cockpit and to make it real with sounds and interviews from the guys who are actually there. And it also has some actual cockpit audio from the war. So it's kind of a dramatic six-episode podcast that brings you into some real hairy stories that happened uh, in the Vietnam Air War. Awesome. And what inspired this show, Matt? Well, my dad was a fighter jock. Uh, He flew F-4s in Vietnam, and he always told such incredibly good stories. And so when the COVID uh, thing happened, uh, I've got a full-time job. I don't do this for a living. So, But I gave him a call, and I got a recorder, and I just let him rip and started recording his calls. Uh, He's 85 years old, and Mm -hmm. he's kind of stuck by himself in his house. uh, And I thought this would be a good thing for him. And I always wanted to capture his stories. So... Uh, He's got a great voice, and he's got a lot of hairy stories, and I thought, what the hell? Let me try to do a podcast about it. (laughs) All right. That sounds pretty good. And uh, where can people find it? People can find Harry on all the major podcast platforms. It's available on Apple and Spotify and Stitcher and all that. And all you have to do is search uh, Harry, H-A-I-R-Y, and you should find it immediately. You can also check out our website. That's harrystories.com. And there you can listen to it directly. Uh, One mention, too, uh, that you'll see on the website, there is a donate button. Mm -hmm. And 100% of all proceeds for the podcast are going directly to the Air Warrior Courage Foundation. Foundation. This is a foundation that helps vets in needs. It was originally started by the guys who started the Red River Rats Association, the River Rats, basically, the okay. Robin Olds founded association from the Vietnam War. So it's definitely all going to a good cause. Awesome. Well, that's really cool, Matt. Appreciate you stopping by telling us about the Harry podcast. Hopefully, if folks like the Fighter Pilot podcast, they'll like the Harry podcast as well. And we'll be sure to check it out. Hey, thank you for everything you do as well. Uh, You did inspire me as well very much, and I love listening to uh, the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Glad to hear it. All right, Matt, thanks for stopping by. Okay, thank you. All right, bud. Well, tell you what, we can begin to wrap this up. We've been yapping for a little while. First, we want to thank our new Patreon strike leads, David Anderson, Richard Peace, Nick Brown. We have a mission commander, Paul Lindsay, and an air boss, David Marquard. And if you're wondering what Patreon is, well, you probably are just listening to this episode for the first time because I'm always harping on Patreon, but it's a really great service that allows you to support the show and to get exclusive content. And it allows me a place to to interact with listeners a little more intimately. And we have advanced screening of interviews. We have behind the scenes stuff. We've got all kinds of other cool things. So head over to patreon.com and look for the Fighter Pilot Podcast and join the group. We have a good core of folks over there and we have a lot of fun. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Crunch, you're a good sport. Thanks for coming back to help us round out our surface-to-air threat and counter tactics discussion. Always a pleasure, my friend. Absolutely. I uh, wouldn't miss it. It was tons of fun. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, speaking of Patreon, one of the things we do is we sometimes bring back past guests for an exclusive Zoom where you and I can just shoot the breeze and the Patreon guys can raise their hand and ask a question. So if you're up for it, I might get you after we record here and uh, see if we can talk you into a maybe a Zoom discussion where people can ask you questions. I love it. All right. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week. We'll see everyone back here in November for Bobber Month. Uh, remember to help us prepare, please, for episode 100 by taking a short survey on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com forward slash 100 survey. By the way, I didn't mention it before, but there's a place there for you to answer what are your favorite or least favorite jello isms. And Crunch, you better not take this survey because I know you've got a hundred of them. <laughs> anyway, favorite episodes, favorite 
favorite guests, worst jelloisms. You can give us all that feedback and you'll hear it at the end of 2020 when we celebrate our 100th episode. Crunch, thanks again. Everybody else, take care of yourselves and we'll see you all back here next time on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening.